doesn't matter how long you've been working with horses, it's always a thrill to get a new horse onto the property. It's always exciting when they come off the float. But then once you get over that excitement, you've got to settle into the daily routine of looking after and caring for your horse. You need to do a daily check of your horse to make sure that everything is okay. And there are a few key things you can look for. First of all, the general alertness of the horse needs to be checked out. Does your horse look healthy? Does he look happy? Does he have a bright expression in his eye? And is he energetic in his uh, way he's running around the paddock? After that, you need to check the coat of the horse. Does the coat have good oil in it? Does it feel nice and soft? Is it smooth? If it's getting a bit dry and maybe a, a bit of straw, you like straw, you might need to look at what your horse is uh, eating, or you may need to worm your horse as well. Uh, after you've looked at that, you need to think about whether your horse is eating properly. Is he eating all the feed you've given him? If he's just out in the, uh, in the paddock, then it can be a little bit harder, but you can check the overall weight of the horse. And a horse that's in a healthy condition should have a good coverage of weight over the ribs. You shouldn't see the ribs there at all. It should have a nice top line with, with plenty of weight across the top there. It should come back to a, a well-rounded, well-filled out rump. There should be no sign of the poverty line, which is the line which can appear down here at the back of the horse uh, when the horse is a little bit underweight. When you check your horse each day, you should check the horse's legs and feet because that's often where problems can occur, particularly if the horse is in a group shared paddock. Uh, the horse can get kicked off on the back legs there, uh, or there may be some other problems in the hoof. You've got to check to make sure there's no stones or nothing else caught under there. A really good thorough check of the legs and feet every day can prevent further problems from occurring. Remember, if you do find anything that's uh, not quite right with your horse, your vet is your expert and is the first person that you should consult. Having a good vet available to you is a really important part of um, successful horse ownership. Remember vets are experts in their field and uh, when you start out with horses uh, you need to learn as much as you can from the vet. You may find that uh, further down the track you can deal with some of the small problems yourself um, but you'll never uh, get enough knowledge to be able to do away with the vet completely. The difficulty with owning horses is that they can't speak. They can't tell us what the problems are. So you really do need the expert knowledge of the vet to be able to find out exactly what it is that's bothering your horse. There are a number of things that you need to do regularly in order to maintain your horse's good health. And these include a yearly visit from the vet or the dentist to uh, do the horse's teeth, uh, setting up a really good uh, deworming program for your horse, and having a regular set of inoculations for your horse. Horses enjoy a visit from the dentist about as much as we enjoy going to the dentist, uh, but it is an essential part of good horse care. Uh, some signs that you might look for to see if your horse is uh, having problems with its teeth are uh, that it could be dropping a lot of feed out of its mouth when it's eating or it could be throwing its head a little bit uh, when you put the bit on and when you go for a ride. These can both be indicators of some problems in the horse's mouth. Horses' teeth are constantly growing unlike ours and as the teeth grow down uh, they wear them down with their normal eating patterns and uh, this results in very sharp edges. Uh, those sharp edges usually need to be filed down about once a year. Usually have uh, a few rasps for different jobs. It's amazing, most horses do tend to cope with this quite well. However, a lot of horses get pretty threatened by it and uh, end up playing up. And in those cases, sometimes they have to be sedated. So David, why do we need to deworm our horses and what's the best way to go about it? We worm our horses because we keep them in, in a very confined area as compared to the wild. Horses pick up worms from their manure and of course they graze in the vicinity of their manure. And in the wild, of course, that manure is spread over a much greater area compared to a small confined paddock. Uh, worms cause problems such as diarrhoea, uh, colic, 
uh, and uh, also just a failure to put on weight. And um, these are very uh, these are these are very common because unfortunately people do get their uh, deworming programs very wrong. The best worm program is through your vet, who is your number one health professional when it comes to looking after your horse. So advice from him or her uh, with respect to brand of wormers and also timing during, throughout the year. Some products will only last about uh, six to eight weeks. Other products do last up to four months. So depending on the program, an average would be about four to six times a year. What inoculations do we need for our horses in Australia? We inoculate or vaccinate against two major diseases, tetanus and strangles. Tetanus is a disease that we all, we all hear about and uh, of course it's caused by bacteria, Clostridium tetani, which can enter the body through any wounds or abscesses and uh, it's extremely important that horses do get vaccinated against this because the actual bacteria that causes tetanus loves horse manure. So not only should your horse be vaccinated against tetanus every five years, but so should the people who are handling horses. For humans, it's every 10 years. Strangles is a very severe infection of the upper respiratory tract. In older horses, we're looking primarily at symptoms of a very, very bad cold. High fever, lethargy, off their feed, and they usually recover fairly uneventfully within one to two weeks. In younger horses though, it can be fatal, and the reason it can be fatal and the reason why it's got the name Strangles is because this bacterial infection results in very large swelling of the glands under their throat which if they become which become so swollen that it can block their airway. Strangles, the Strangles vaccine is once a year so that's an annual shot which we try and time with something that occurs annually such as having their teeth done. Horse owners can actually uh, vaccinate their own horses um, however, the program should be under the strict guidance of your vet. There's a lot of things that you need to think about in the care of your horse and it's a really good idea to set yourself up with a horse diary and you can keep a list of when things were done and when they need to be done again. There are a number of key aspects to bear in mind when you're looking for somewhere to keep your horse. If you're looking for a paddock, then you need to ensure that it has good pasture. It should be free of weeds and there should be no holes. Rabbit holes or wombat holes in Australia are particularly dangerous. The paddock should also have safe fencing. Post and rail fencing is ideal and electric fencing can make it uh, really safe. Uh, electric fencing with wire is okay, but you should steer clear of any barbed wire. Barbed wire can be particularly dangerous and cause nasty injuries for horses. Your paddock should also have plenty of shelter. That shelter can be provided by good trees, or if there's no trees around, then it should have a nice wooden shelter, which can give the horse uh, respite from the sun and uh, from the stormy weather. The paddock should also have a good supply of fresh water. Uh, this can be provided by a trough with uh, taps running into it, um, or by fresh creek water, or by a pond or a dam. Uh, dam water can, be, can get a bit stagnant and can be a little bit tricky, so a spring-fed dam is the ideal for this situation. You must remember that young horses are made up of 80% water. Uh, this drops to 50 to 60% as they get older, and it's essential that they have a good regular supply of water. You need to decide whether you want to put your horse into a shared paddock or a private paddock. A shared paddock can be great for the horse. It's in the herd environment, which is its natural environment. There are some dangers, of course. Your horse could be kicked, or it uh, may be uh, at the bottom of the pecking order in the paddock and not be that happy. 
Uh, putting your horse in a private paddock can be a problem as well, in that horses do need that interaction with other animals. If you go for a private paddock, you need to be sure that you take your horse out of its paddock every day and groom it and exercise it and ensure that it has a healthy, happy state of mind. There's nothing better than that lovely smell of warm horses on a cold winter's morning in the stable. Uh, and stabling in a cold environment uh, can be a particularly good way to keep your horse healthy and happy. Your stables need to be large enough, they should be at least uh, 12 foot by 12 foot, uh, they must have no sharp edges and it's really important that they have a good airflow through them. Uh, plenty of horses get respiratory problems from damp, musty stables. You have a choice of bedding with your stables. Uh, sawdust and straw are the ones most commonly used and they both provide good, effective bedding which will ensure that your horses don't hurt themselves and that they stay warm. But remember that stables are a lot of work. You have to clean them out uh, twice a day, you have to uh, check the water and uh, your horses need to be groomed as well to make sure that their circulation stays sound. Horses also shouldn't spend too much time in the stables. Um, problems such as wind sucking and cribbing and uh, chewing can all be caused by horses which have become bored through spending too much time in their stables and not enough time out in the natural environment. A healthy horse needs healthy food and getting the feed program right for your horse is very important. Horses are highly individual animals and have separate requirements. You will need to find a feed regime which suits your horse, its temperament and working patterns. There are five simple rules which can help you develop a good feed program for your horse. One, feed more bulk than concentrate. The bulk feeds, or forage as they are sometimes called, are grass, hay and chaff. And horses need plenty of these to keep their digestive systems functioning. Concentrate feeds such as grain and pellets are essential for providing protein. If your horse is needing more energy, then it is the concentrated feeds that you would increase. But you must always feed more bulk than concentrate. The second rule is to feed your horse little and often. Horses have small stomachs and cannot digest large quantities of feed in one go. They are grazing animals, and they are effectively meant to be eating 24 hours a day. There's no point giving your horse a big bucket of feed in the evening. You should try and break that up into two or three smaller feeds fed throughout the day. The third rule is to feed according to work. The more work your horse is doing, the more energy it is going to need, and the more concentrates you will need to feed it. You should be careful, however, to separate your horse's feeding routine from its work routine. Don't work the horse just after it's been fed, and don't feed the horse just after it's been worked. The fourth rule is to change feed gradually. Horses are very susceptible to any changes in their feed patterns or in the feed that you are giving them. You should always change their feed slowly over the period of a week. The fifth rule of feeding is to always have fresh water available. An adult horse's body weight is made up to 50 to 60 percent of water and water loss can cause illness and in a severe case even death. The water requirements of any horse will depend on its age, the type of feed it's eating and the amount of exercise it is taking. It's essential that you always have fresh water available for your horses. If you get into a good routine with your grooming, most horses will really enjoy it. Even stabled horses need to be groomed regularly because this helps to keep the circulation flowing for them. Your horse should have its own grooming kit. This will help prevent the spread of any skin problems or infections from horse to horse. A basic kit consists of a dandy brush with long stiff bristles to remove dirt and mud from the coat, a body brush with short soft bristles to remove the very fine dirt and grease, 
a metal curry comb for cleaning your brushes, a rubber curry comb for removing heavier bits of dirt from the horse, a plastic mane comb or a hairbrush to work on the mane, a sponge for wiping around the horse's eyes, muzzle and ears, and a hoof pick and hoof oil or grease for proper care of the hoof. Washing your horse from time to time is a good idea and there are a couple of points to remember about this. Make sure that you use a suitable horse shampoo and that the shampoo gets completely washed out of the horse's coat, otherwise some skin problems may occur. Uh, also, you need to allow enough time for your horse to dry, so you wouldn't want to wash your horse too late in the afternoon. Grooming your horse is not just about keeping it clean, it's about making sure your horse is healthy. Uh, particularly if your horse is stabled or rugged, you need to make sure that you groom your horse on a daily basis in order to help with its circulation. Uh, a good grooming, starting at the front and going all the way to the back, will really make sure, it's like a massage for the horse, and it'll really make sure that the horse's coat and skin are in good condition. A few tips about grooming. Uh, when you groom, you start with the stiffer bristled brushes and you move through to the softer ones. You start at the front of the horse and you move your way back and you always try and follow the line of the horse's hair. It's pretty easy to see the way that that hair grows out and you follow that line. There may be some times when you need to go against it a little bit to get some particularly difficult bits of mud off or you may need to use your uh, hands a little bit to get some mud off there, some particularly difficult bits of mud. Uh, there are a few safety tips when you're grooming your horse. Always stay close to the horse, you don't want to do it at arm's length and when you move around the back of the horse, stay close and talk to the horse and let them know that you're coming around. As you groom your horse, you should always make sure that you don't kneel down, that you're in a position where you can move quickly if the horse gets a fright. So don't go down on your knees and in particular, never put your hand on the ground. If you put your hand on the ground, the horse gets a fright and jumps sideways, you could really do yourself a serious injury. Enjoy your grooming time with your horse. It should take between uh, half an hour and uh, uh, an hour to groom your horse properly. And ho most horses have one or two things that they really enjoy. With this horse, he loves having just inside his wither there scratch, just around the side of his wither. It really gives him a lot of pleasure. He enjoys that and it's something we try and do regularly to help keep him happy and help him really enjoy that process. One final uh, safety tip, when you're going around to the other side of the horse, always go around the front under the neck or round the back, staying close to the horse, but never go under the stomach of the horse. It's not safe and you should never do that. When you go to clean out the horse's front hooves, you stand by the horse's shoulder facing backwards, run your hand down the leg and then just gently put your weight into the horse and pick the leg up. When you go to clean the foot out with your hoof pick underneath the, uh, the hoof there, you start at the, uh, at the heel and you work your way back with the hoof pick. This will make sure it doesn't hurt the horse at all. Then once you've got the worst of that out, give it a brush off. And there you've got a pretty clean hoof with the horse ready to start work. Picking up the horse's back leg, you again are facing backwards and again staying very close to the horse. You run your hand down the inside of the horse's leg, this keeps it nice and safe, and then just pick it up and gently ease the foot back and then rest it gently on the inside of your leg like that. Then you go through the same process of cleaning it out from the heel to the toe. Finding a good farrier is an important part of horse ownership. There is an old saying, no hoof, no horse. This recognises the importance of the hoof if we are to have a sound horse. The horse should be shot every six to eight weeks, and a good farrier will look at your horse's overall confirmation to see if there is any corrective work which might need to be done. Farriers have a variety of tools that they use, and it normally takes about 45 minutes to shoe a horse. Your horse could be either hot shot or cold shot. Hot shoeing gives a neater fit, but cold shoeing can be very effective as well. There are different types of shoes for different horses. A heavier, bigger horse will have a thicker shoe, and there are many different types of corrective shoes which can be put on for different problems. You can even get glue on shoes for horses with particularly brittle walls on their hooves. A necessary part of good horse care is the daily maintenance of your horse's hooves. 
You should pick out underneath the hooves, making sure that there are no stones caught in there, and then oil the wall and the sole of the hoof. Let's follow the farrier's procedure as he shoes the horse. The nail ends or clenches are cut off and the shoe is gently eased from the hoof. The surplus growth on the hoof wall is removed with hoof cutters. The hoof is cleaned and trimmed with the curved drawing knife. This has its point turned over for safety. Then the surface of the foot is made level by rasping the underside. The farrier then shapes the shoe and places it on the hoof. The nails are then driven home while the hoof is held between the farrier's knees. The nail ends are wrung off in the hammer claw and turned to form clenches. The rim of the foot is tidied with a rasp and the farrier also rasps just under the clenches so as to be able to hammer them over flat. In the finished foot, the nails are driven home flush with the shoe, the toe clip is central and the clenches follow the line of the coronet band. Transporting a horse is one of the most unnatural things we expect of our uh, equine friends. We're asking a claustrophobic animal to walk onto a rattly wooden box and to stand quietly. It's quite remarkable that most of them do it so well. However, a lot of horses do have problems and you certainly don't want to buy a problem traveller with your first horse. Your first horse should be good to load and should travel quietly and you want to test this out before you buy it. You should establish a good routine when preparing your horse for travel. First, unless it is very cold, remove any heavy rugs that your horse may have on as it will simply sweat too much. Uh, horses do sweat a lot when they're travelling. Then put on travel boots to help protect the legs. There are many different sorts of boots, but for a smaller horse or pony, uh, the type of boots that we show here will do the job well. Next, you should put on a tail wrap or a tail bandage and uh, this will help protect the horse from any damage caused by rubbing the tail. Make sure that you have a good halter and lead rope on. When you're ready to load the horse, uh, face it up to the float and try to avoid letting the horse look away. It should stay focused on the float and not see any other options. Ask the horse to walk forward, always remembering to release the pressure on the rope and the halter as the horse walks with you. This is its reward. This should be done whenever you're leading a horse. Make sure that you don't stand in front of the horse. The horse needs to see where it's going to walk. If it can't see past you into the float, it's a bit unreasonable to expect it to go on there. Uh, once the horse is on, don't tie it up until the breaching doors or the ramp or the chain are locked in place. This is very important as the horse could really do themselves some damage if they tried to pull back. When unloading your horse, always untie it before lowering the tailgate or undoing the chain or opening the breaching doors. There are a number of expert methods for uh, teaching difficult horses to load and if you're having trouble you should seek some expert help. But remember, your first horse should be a good traveller.